Hello, I'm Charles from Charles Inn Photography and thanks for joining me today. Today I'm going to be adding three wildlife photos in Adobe Lightroom. The last of these photos we're also going to be editing in Adobe Photoshop. We'll only be using the Content Aware tool in Photoshop. I just want to show you this because some people wonder how I edit my wildlife photos and also they know that sometimes things have been taken out of the photos so the last photo which is of a beachstone curlew will edit the photo in Adobe Lightroom and then once all the editing is done we'll actually go over to Adobe Photoshop we'll export the photo we'll use the content aware tool to remove items that we don't want in our photo so let's get stuck in now and we'll open up the first photo which is of a water dragon so here are my three photos we have the first photo is of a, an eastern water dragon the second is of a sacred kingfisher and the third is of a beachstone curlew so we go into the develop mode now the first thing we do when we come into the develop mode is we click on the lens profile now Adobe Lightroom doesn't it doesn't matter what camera you use all that Adobe Lightroom is interested in is the lens that you're using and it has a lot of profiles for these lenses now I've actually made a couple of user profiles for my lenses that I use as you can see here on the left I have the Nikon 200 to 500 mil which is the lens I use for nearly all my prof all my wildlife photography if you're just starting out and you don't have any profiles over here what you do is you go to the lens correction tool you click on the profile up here on the right first you click on the make of the lens for me it's a Nikon then you click on the model for me I've got to scroll all the way down here to the Nikon 200 500 and you can see it's ticked off so we click on it and it assigns a profile now just about every lens has oddities it could be a bit of barrel distortion it could be some pin cushion it is a wise idea to actually check to see if you have a lens profile associated with your lens and it actually helps you get rid of all these eccentrics from your lens this is why I just click on the profile and all this is done so we start off in the basic module up the top here and the first thing we do is we assign a color profile now if we click on profile we can see we have Adobe color Adobe landscape portrait standard and vivid now for my wildlife I actually like using the Adobe color profile but if I'm shooting landscapes and astro I much prefer to use either the Adobe landscape or the Adobe vivid profile if I use the landscape or the vivid profiles in my wildlife photos it just gives too much saturation and too much oomph to the photo and for wildlife photos I really like to try to keep it natural so this is the profile I like to use next what we do is before we do any edit editing we decide how we're going to crop this photo and as you can see this lizard here is sitting on a on a concrete barrier and we're just going to remove some of that barrier because it's actually a bit of a distraction a lot of time we have a rule it's called the rule of thirds now even in wildlife I don't like putting a photo in the center of my image I actually like putting it slightly to the side now this lizard as you can see is facing to the left so I'll actually put him or it is a him I'll actually put the lizard slightly to the right of center so he's actually looking into the frame if the lizard was actually had its face facing towards the right I would actually put the lizard facing on the left of the frame now we can see here that if I decide to go into thirds here we can see on his chest here he's got a very dark V there so but then his eye here is a little bit further away so I like, I'll actually split that in half I'll crop it a little bit more I'll split the distance in half so you can see like this is halfway here where my cursor is this is halfway and I'll just split the distance in half now you can actually see if we click done here this looks much nicer there's a little bit of gap here and what I tell people is when you're cropping don't crop too tight 
especially if you're thinking that you're going to frame this image later. Most of the time people like having a border around the frame. So you've got to give yourself at least 10 to 20 mils for the border. So this is about as much as of this image that I'd like to crop. So now we choose the white balance. Now for my wildlife photos, I actually choose auto white balance. I just like to, to leave it like that. But if it was for landscape or astro, I actually choose a manual white balance. And I talk about this when I, I'll be actually editing some sunset photos a little bit later in another video. But for now, we're just using auto white balance. But we have this little eyedropper here. Now this eyedropper, if I bring it around the frame, if we look towards the top left hand corner here, we have the navigator. So it's actually a preview. And if I, I move around this thing, now if I go onto the chest here with the eyedropper, can you see in the navigator that everything is a greeny color? If I come up here to the black, it's much more natural. If I click on the green down here, it shows off a pink. The reason being is that this color picker is basically colorblind. You're not choosing a color. What you're actually telling the picker is where you put the picker is neutral gray. So what we're going to do is below the legs here on the right hand side, the concrete is blurred out, but it's a very neutral gray area. So we'll click on it. It's actually adjusted the white balance very slightly to what it was. And I quite like this color. So now we start adjusting the, the photo. Now, Adobe Lightroom, if you look on the right hand side of the develop module, it comes in and there's a lot of large lines separating each module. This is a very good hint to say everything in this module should be worked together. But if we look here in the exposure settings, we have exposure and contrast and it's hard to see, but just underneath the contrast, there is a very thin line. This line tells you that even though the exposure and contrast and then we have highlights, shadows, whites and blacks, these should be treated separately but they're actually all part of one group. First we'll adjust the exposure just that little bit because it's slightly underexposed now. This looks much better already. Then we have highlights, shadows, whites and blacks. And although it starts off highlights, shadows, whites and blacks, you are much better off starting with the blacks to make sure that you don't clip the blacks and then you work your way up. You have blacks, whites, shadows and highlights. Now, there are very good keyboard shortcuts and I work on a PC. So if I hit the Alt key, touch the black slider here, you can see that it goes to a wide screen. Now, if I go towards the left, you can see that we've got all different sorts of colors. This shows us that the blacks are clipped so we just keep sliding towards the right until we don't see any color at all apart from white. Now this tells me that my blacks are not clipped now. And we do the same thing for the whites. So the whites we want a totally black screen. So if I go all the way over to the white on the right, you can see that there's a lot of black. So we keep sliding back until we have a black screen. Now that's it. So the whites and blacks now are taken care of. The shadows and the highlights, I actually prefer to do a visual, but I will show you the shortcut key to do the same thing. It's still, we hold the Alt, and for the shadows, it's very hard to see. But if I'm all the way to the left here, just towards the bottom, I can just see a little bit of color. But I'll reset it to neutral, to zero, and the highlights is the same thing. If I go all the way to the right, you can see just a little bit of color there. So we just bring it slightly back. That's it. I actually like to have the background slightly darkened. So I just bring the highlights down visually. Now you might not think we've done a lot here, but if we go into the preview from before and after, you'll actually see how much we've actually changed. And this is down the bottom on the left hand here below the image. First you have the loop view, then you have a reference view. Then we have, it's called YY. It's cycled between before and after views. So if we click on that, you can see the left panel here is what we started with and the right is what we're working with now. And you can already see there is a very big difference and we've just gotten started. 
By the way, I actually shoot in RAW, so if you were doing this in a JPEG photo, you could do about all of this except the white balance. White balance is something that is very locked in and you could only adjust it very marginally if you were using a JPEG photo. So now we come up to the presence. So we have texture, clarity and dehaze. I never use texture for my wildlife photos. Texture adds grain. So I never use texture in my wildlife photos. Texture would be very good to use if you were photographing, let's say a rock wall or a olden style building with very old bricks or Bessa blocks that had a lot of grit to it. So the texture slider would actually add detail to all that. But I don't want this in my wildlife photos, especially when I've got a very cleanish background, because if I add texture, I will actually be adding grain to my background. And that's the last thing that I want to do. So we leave the texture alone and we're only touching the clarity and the dehaze. Dehaze is a very good tool to use to actually just sharpen up and give your photo a little bit of a wow factor. But it's a double-edged sword. Too much dehaze and it'll actually start looking gritty. What we do is we use the Alt key again. We hold the Alt key down and as soon as we touch the dehaze slider, you can see we're coming to a white screen. So we just slide it to the right until we just see colors. Uh, that's it. It's just showing up now. I'll just bring it back down. So at plus 19, this is how you use the dehaze. Now, if I add any more than that, it's actually going to tell me that I've added too much dehaze. Now, the clarity tool, I basically use the same way. It won't work with the Alt key. The best way to use the clarity tool is to zoom in by about 50%. So this is 100%. So I'm zoomed in one and one. If I reset the clarity tool to zero, watch the, the face of the water dragon as I use the clarity tool. Now we'll bring it up to about 24. Now that's quite sharp and it hasn't added too much. If we go into the minus, can you see how we've sort of softened up the image? A very good point here is when you're editing stuff, all you have to do is just hit the control Z. If you've made an error, just hit control Z and it'll take you back to the last piece of editing that you've done. So we hit control Z and you can see that my clarity has actually gone up to 24. We're nearly there. Now this is just about perfect but the background is just slightly too colorful for my liking. So the next tool we use is in the HS cell. So we have hue, saturation, luminance. Now we don't touch hue. All we touch is a saturation and luminance. And as you can see, we have all the different colors down here. Nature doesn't give us singular colors. They're always a bland. And there's a little tool on the side here where if you click on it, it analyzes where you've actually clicked on the photo and it will adjust any color that is in that area. So this is a little slider here. So we click on it and we bring it over. Now I want to reduce the saturation of these greens. So I click on the green. Now, if I push it upwards, I'm actually saturating these colors. And you can see that there's green and yellow. Now, if I bring it down, what's happening is I'm desaturating greens and yellows. Now you can see that the water dragon is actually popped up because now the background is muted. So you're actually emphasizing the water dragon much more. This is a very good photo to show you this on because the water dragon, which is our subject, doesn't have any greens at all. So it's a very good photo for the sort of stuff. You could do the same thing if, let's say you had a bird, a white bird and a bluish background and the sky was a very brightish blue and you wanted to sort of desaturate that blue. So you could actually just click on the sky and desaturate the blue. Now what we have to do is we also have to go into the luminance now and counteract the amount of desaturation because it looks a bit flat. Come up back here to the luminance and on the same area that we clicked on, we just slightly slide it up just that fraction. What this does is actually balance the desaturation and the luminance. So although we've desaturated the image, the colors in our background, we've actually just increased the luminance. So it doesn't have that sort of washed out look to it. It still looks very natural. This photo was taken at ISO 450. 
they could be a slight amount of noise. Now we come over to the sharpening here. Now in my Nikon 200 to 500 lens profile, I've already set the amount of sharpening that I use on all the photos, but I will show you how you'd start. So this is called selective sharpening. So you don't want to be sharpening the whole image because all we we're trying to do is define our subject, which in this case is the lizard. What we do is we come up here to the masking and we hit the Alt key again. And as soon as we start sliding the mask key to the right, can you see how we've, we're getting a lot of black in the background? Now understand that everything that is white in the image will get sharpened. Any of the black areas will not get sharpened. So we don't want to sharpen the background. So we just keep sliding until all we get is just the lizard and a bit of the foreground. We start sliding again and we're about 75. And can you see now, now I'm holding at 75. Can you see now that the lizard is very well defined, but look at the background. There is no sharpening in the background. This will mean that we can add quite a bit of sharpening to our lizard, but we won't add any sharpening, any grain noise to our image. So now if I zoom in, look at that. We've got a very sharp lizard, but look at the, the background there. There is hardly any noise. So now if I wanted to, I could add just a little bit of noise reduction to the image. Not a lot, just that little bit. But understand that this is a Lightroom tutorial. I do use plugins. They're called the Nick plugins. And one of these plugins is called Define, which is very good at removing selective digital noise. So I normally don't use the noise reduction in Adobe Lightroom, apart from my Astro photos, my Milky Way photos. And I will use it in that. But normally, if I find that there's noise in my wildlife photos or in my landscape photos, then I use the, the plugin for Define. But today we're just dealing in Lightroom, so I'll show you how we just remove a little bit of the digital noise. So we slowly slide up. I'm going to take it to about 10. And you can see I've already removed it. Now we don't need a totally smooth background. Watch what happens if I actually take it quite high. We've lost all the noise, but at the same time, what we've done is actually we've lost a bit of detail in the, the lizard. This is not the idea of denoising an image. We bring it back down to 10. Now I am very happy with that. So we click back on it and that's it. Our image is done. It's taken us about five or six minutes to do. If I really wanted to go a step further, what I could do is use the brush tool and just paint over the background and totally blur the background out. For an image like this, there is no need. I always tell people, you've got to keep your image lifelike. If you blur too much of the background, it will be very evident and it'll look like you've done a cut and paste. And that is not the idea of when you're doing editing. The idea is to keep a very realistic photo when you finally edit it. So if we go into our preview here, there you go, you can see this is our preview and this is what we started with. But I can see that the belly of the lizard here is slightly dark. So we can come up here back to the basic and now I can just add a little bit of shadow, shadow highlights. And you can see like, can you see that the belly? We've actually just upped the shadows a bit. so. We've got a very good idea of what the color looks like there. It's starting to pop the photo and it hasn't affected too much of the rest of our photo. If I wanted to, if I want to add a little bit of saturation just to the reds here, I can come back into the hue saturation, click on the saturation slider, click on the little tool down here and here click on the reddish purple and then just slide it up slightly. And all this will do will just emphasize a little bit of that color. Because it was in the shade, there wasn't any sun on it, it will have been a little bit flat. So by doing this, we'll actually just amplify a bit of its color to what it could be if the sun was shining on. But we still have to do the same thing to the luminance. So now we come down here, we just bring it back down slightly. 
this looks really good. Now I'm just going to go back to basic and just slightly lift the exposure just a tad. That is it. So all I have to do now is just export this photo. So you can see how easy it is and it's not time consuming. It just takes a bit of patience. So now we'll actually move on to our second photo which is the Kingfisher. So this is our second photo. It's of a sacred Kingfisher feeding its young in the nest. Now before I go any further let me say that although it looks like I'm very close to this sacred Kingfisher I'm actually a good 10-12 meters away from it. This was taken near Lake Eden at North Lakes and this Kingfisher nests about one and a half meters from the side of a poplar walkway. I was actually close to 12 meters away on the opposite side of the walking track sitting down on a park bench and bracing myself with my lens so that when it comes in and these kingfishers when they come in to feed their young they come in very quickly so I could actually be very well braced fire off eight to ten shots while it's feeding its young and then hopefully try to get a couple of shots as it's flying away. There is no flash used in any of my photography. This is why in this shot I'll actually show you how to try to bring out a little bit of the black hole here because there's actually a couple of young kingfishers, juveniles, in this hole. And this is why this photo was taken at ISO 1600 because it's in the shade. So I don't mind shooting at high ISO because I'm just getting a very natural image. This photo was taken in landscape orientation but we're actually going to crop it into an 8x10 vertical portrait image because there's just too much around here and I just want just a little bit of detail on the side of the Kingfisher. So let's start editing. The so the first thing we do is we'll crop the image. Now instead of original I select 8x10, I zoom in and as I come in you can see that 8 inch wide, 10 inch high but if I bring it down you can actually see now that it's back into landscape orientation. I bring it back. Now all I do is move it towards the Kingfisher and I'll put the Kingfisher in the middle here and move it around like that. Now let's see how that looks. Now that looks pretty good. Now remember with the water dragon I said I don't like putting something in the middle. This one you could just about put in the middle but it actually looks quite nice just to the right of halfway. So it's actually sort of looking into the bird. So it's actually looking like it's looking inside the nest. It's slightly underexposed so we'll bring up the exposure a bit. But we have to be careful that we don't blow out the whites here on the neck of this kingfisher. We adjust the white balance and we'll find a bit of neutral grey and we look here on the, the back of the head of Kingfisher here we've got a bit of grey so we click on it. Now that looks much better. Can you see how we've clicked it and it's a much more neutral colour? There's not a lot of warmth in this image so we don't want to sort of warm up the, the photo too much at the start. We've adjusted exposure. One thing I didn't say in the last photo is I actually don't touch the contrast. I rarely add contrast to my wildlife photos. So we start the blacks again and we can see just in the nest here the blacks are clipped so we come up here. Okay that's right. Now we check the whites. We bring the whites back down. Now I'll just dab the highlights down a little bit and the reason I'm doing that is just to get a little bit of detail in those that white area of that white band just below its eyes. So I just want a bit of detail in those feathers there. Now we'll just increase the shadows a little bit. If I go all the way up you can actually see here that we can just start seeing a bit of a sneaky amount and there's like two little lumps in here. And these are the young kingfishers. We're actually going to use a brush tool to get to show them up too much so we'll just lighten up the image just a little bit in the shadows. Now we have clarity and dehaze. Now dehaze we do the same thing we hold the alt key 
we slide it up until we start seeing lines. There, we come back. That's it. Now, the clarity, I'll zoom in to one to one and I'll just slowly slide it up until I'm set. Now, that looks quite good like that. So we zoom out. Now, the vibrance and saturation, I won't touch at the moment. And we go now to the HSL. I'm pretty happy with the colors here. But if you wanted just to saturate the colors a little bit here, this is where you do it. So we click on saturation. And if I, on the greeny blue here on the aqua, we slide it up a little bit, just a fraction. I can go a little bit. I'll go on the side of the feathers here, just that slight amount. Now, remember that if we touch the saturation, we also use touch the luminance. So now we come back to the blue first, scroll down just that little bit on the greens as well. Now I'm very happy with that. Now we come up to the detail. Now, I showed you how I used the sharpening last time, so I'll leave it alone because I found these settings work very good for all my wildlife. But we'll see how much digital noise is in the photo. So we zoom back out to one-on-one, -on -one and we can see that even though this is shot at 1,600, there is hardly any digital noise. If I go into two-to-one, so this is a 200%, we can see that there's just a little bit of noise. You can see it here in the beak. I'm being very pedantic here. If I slide it to about 10, that's it. But really, you wouldn't see the digital noise because the termite mound, we'll, we'll click out of it. The termite mound actually hides a lot of the noise. And because it's got fairly dark feathers, you really wouldn't see any of the noise. Now, with all our adjustments, the image is just that little bit dark. We'll just increase the exposure just that tab. So we'll, it's at plus 0.36 and we'll just take it up slightly. Okay, now it looks good. Now remember that it's to keep the image realistic. It was shot in the shade. You can see most people would be able to tell that it was shot in the shade because if the sun was shining on there, you'd actually see the termite mound have sort of a a brown, the orangey glow on it. So, and the bird would actually have much more sheen on it than being in the shade. We're replicating what we actually photographed. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the radial filter just to darken up the termite mount around the bird to reduce the amount of detail in there, just so that the bird pops out a bit more. So we go up here to the top, we have radial filter here and we grab the radial filter and we keep opening it up. Now the difference between the radial filter and the brush tool, the brush tool is always round. Whereas the radial filter, you can actually manipulate it how you like it. You can make it round, you can make it like a football shape like I'm doing now. I come down here to the show mask overlay on the bottom right, on the bottom left corner and everywhere where is red, is where the mask is going to be added. It's where I'm actually going to be working. I actually don't want to touch the bird. I'm wanting to touch the outside of the bird. We keep adjusting. This takes a few minutes, so we keep adjusting it. We'll fatten up the radial filter a little bit. There's no need to rush anything. We just take our time. Now, I've actually got a very smooth graduation between where I'm editing and not. But if it was, if the feather was at zero, this is what it would look like. So if I was editing that, to give you an idea, now we take the mask off so we, we can see it. So if I reduce, let's say the exposure by 50%, let's say one EV, click done. Can you see how unrealistic it looks? Really not good. So this is why we have a feather. And the feather is basically just a taper. So we don't want a huge amount of taper, but just enough so that it's not visible in the photo. So we come back up here, we click on our radial filter, and there's a little dot here. We click on a dot, and you can see that it's gone from gray to black, so it's active. And now 
we actually increase the feather. That looks much better. Now we'll actually bring the, the exposure back to, to zero and we'll just slightly underexpose it. If we reduce the clarity, we're actually going to be softening up the edges of the termite mound just that little bit. And that's all I want. I'm very happy with this image. If I wanted to do it the other way of slightly underexposing the image and just bringing out the highlights of the bird, all I would do, I'm not going to touch this radial filter, but I could just, I'll do it with another one exactly the same. I'll click on radial filter, bring it out. I select the mask overlay, but this time down here, see underneath the feather, we click on invert and you can see now that we're actually working inside the bird so if I brought it in like this over the edge a little bit more fattened up a little bit and bring it down okay if we take the overlay the mask off so we can see it now if I decide to saturate the bird I can just come up here and see I'm just sliding on the saturation so if I go to zero the whole bird is grey if I slide on the saturation a little bit I'm actually just saturating the bird and I actually haven't saturated the termite mound so the bird really pops so the big difference between Lightroom and Photoshop is in Photoshop you can work in layers and you're just stacking layers upon layers like bricks on an image. In Lightroom you cannot do that. Lightroom you're working on a single image but all these additives like the radial filter, the brush tool, the grad filter, they're basically layers so every time you click on one of these you're added hypothetically a layer and these are all independent of each other so at the end of the image if you say well I really don't want that saturation or I don't want darkening the side it's quite easy you just click on your mask and you come over here and you click on the one that you don't want anymore and you delete it and it's gone and you haven't affected all the rest so we click done we'll actually leave it like this now we actually really want to sort of just get a little bit more light in the nest hollow so we want a little bit more light in the nest hollow so so this is a 200 percent now we click the brush tool we click show overlay and we reduce our tool quite a bit and we actually select auto mask so that it's only going to paint inside the hole and you can see as long as i'm staying what happens when you click on auto mask if you've got two very contrasting colors like black and then light brown or white it'll only adjust the color that you're on the little center square as long as you keep that to the side it'll adjust just the colors there but if you've got a bit of a mix of colors sometimes it'll actually encroach a little bit but this is a perfect tool and some people that sort of photograph cars and they want to change the whole color of the car they'll actually change the color of the car or if you want to change the background let's say from if you've got a blue background and you want it to green you can easily just paint around the blue or the green this is a very quick way of doing things scroll around and you can see here while I'm touching the beak around the neck it's not touching at all but here I've got to be very careful because the beak is very dark and I don't actually want to mask over the beak. So I'll click auto mask off now and I'll just finish it. Oh, sorry, I'll actually click it back on because I just want the edges here. That's it. Now I've actually gone slightly inside the beak here. So I'll click auto mask off and we can paint or we can erase so if I click on the erase here which is just on the side here I'll actually just slightly erase where I've painted over there now we take the mask overlay off so we can see what we're doing now 
I can actually increase the exposure slightly, increase the shadows a little bit. Here where you see noise, a lot of people have a misconception of this noise. They think that if they go into the minus, they're actually reducing the noise. But it's actually the opposite. You're actually denoising. That's the slide is a denoise slide. So if you go to the right, you're actually reducing the amount of noise in your photo. So this is what we'll do. So we'll slide it to the right a little bit. There's no need to add saturation or, or dehaze or anything like that here. And we click done. Or we zoom back out. We haven't done much, but it's not a black hole now. You actually have got an idea that there is something inside the hole. So this image is done. Now this has taken us about 10 minutes, but if I was doing this by myself, about five, six minutes, it's all it would take. So let's move on to the next photo, which is the photo of the Beachstone Curlew, and we will use both Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. We'll edit the whole photo in Lightroom, and then right at the end, we'll open up Photoshop, and we'll remove some of the uh, items in the photo that I don't want inside here. So here's our Beachstone Curlew photo. So we click on the Nikon profile. Now, this is what I don't want. See this log that's sticking out here? I really like how this Beachstone Curl is looking. It's looking back towards me with its beak open. It was actually calling out to its mate when I was taking these photos. There was two of them on the beach and they kept calling to each other. And that's why it's got its beak open, because it's calling out. So I really don't like this log. And also this little leaf here that's on the beach, it's yellow and it's very distracting to the rest of the image. It's like, it doesn't look like it should be there. We've got a very bland background for the, it's actually not the sky, it's actually the beach, the tides out, and the foreground here. So these are the two things that I will be removing inside Photoshop. But first we'll edit the photo. The first thing we do is we crop the image to what we want. Now remember, because it's looking to the right, we'll actually show it that way. If I put it like I did the last photo like this and click done, it doesn't really look right because it, the, big, the bird's pointing and it's pointing out of the image. So we're actually going to have the bird on the left side of the image, of center. So we bring it around here. There. Now, that leaf that I thought could be a problem is hardly there. But what is there is right down the bottom here, I'm circling around, you can actually see it's like a little stick that's in focus and it's very distracting, especially to me. And just below the tail here, see there's like a piece of driftwood or a stick on the beach and it's sticking out. So now let's start editing. So. We'll bring up the exposure a little bit. Now you might notice that just about all my photos are slightly underexposed. I actually prefer to have my photos slightly underexposed than overexposed. Modern cameras, it's very easy to bring back your exposure, but if you blow the highlights in your raw file, you can't get that detail back. So it's always good just to make sure that you're slightly underexposed. And a lot of time when I'm photographing, I'm either using spot metering or center weighted. That's how I photograph wildlife. And if I'm slightly underexposed, it's not a big deal. If it's the exposure is quite a way down underexposed, then I will use exposure compensation to correct my exposure. But I'll be very mindful to keep an eye that I don't blow out the shot. So if I move from one point to another, then I quickly reset the exposure compensation to zero just to make sure that the next shots that I take will not be overexposed. So we come down to our blacks and we slide down until we see. Okay, so there we go. 
Oh, that's zero. We do the same for whites. Keep sliding down. Now, I can see here my histogram. I'm very close to the edge. It's a bit bright. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to reduce the highlights. And while I'm reducing the highlights here, if you actually look on the bottom on the sand here, the sand has actually started getting a bit of detail. And this is because I've reduced the highlights. You can actually see a bit of the detail. Now, the shadows here, I'll actually bring down a little bit. The reason I'm bringing the shadows down is just, I want a bit of contrast on this bird to actually show that the tail is actually in the shade. If I actually up the shadows on this bird, it doesn't look real. It's a very bright sunny day. You can see that the bird, the shadows is actually the bird, the sun. You can actually see the sun is casting a shadow on the ground here. So, but you can't see it on the tail with the shadows all the way up. So if we bring it down here, it's very realistic. Now this is a little bit too much because I've taken away too much detail in the head area. So that looks very good. Now we come up to the dehaze and we just slide it up to 10. Now remember the last one, when we slid the dehaze for the Kingfisher, we were up to about 35 before the dehaze kicked in and we could actually see it. So every photo is different. So you've really got to be mindful of that. Don't think that, okay, well this photo is 30, all my photos will have to be 30. No, you have to do it for every photo. And the clarity here, we'll just increase the clarity a little bit just to define the bird a bit. Okay, that looks really good. I don't need to touch the, hue, the saturation or the luminance. If I want to, I could just increase the yellows here just that little bit. So I come up to saturation, click on yellow, and I could just increase the saturation just that little bit. What about the brown? Let's see if we do the brown as well. Now see, we think it's brown, but look, we're actually sliding the orange and the yellow up. Okay, so we click done. What I will do is I'll quickly just skip back to the Kingfisher because I didn't show you a before and after shot. So this is the Kingfisher. So if we click on before and after, so you can see on the left here, is our image before and on the right is what we finished and you can see that there hasn't been much work done we've brought out the exposure a bit we saturated the colors of the bird just that slight amount but it is still very lifelike and this is what I tell people you've got to keep it realistic now we'll get back to our bird okay so let's see what it looks before and after there you go, look at that. There's a very clear difference. And it's taken us, what, five, six minutes to get here? And like I stated when we were doing the lizard, remember, just little steps at a time. It doesn't need to be big. Just take your little steps at a time and you will end up with a great photo. So now we've finished here. So now we're going to export the file into Photoshop. Now. This is the beauty of Adobe Lightroom in that we don't have to save the file and reopen it into Photoshop. We can just click on the file and say export to Photoshop and it will export the file as a TIFF file into Photoshop. We do all the work we want and then we save the file and it brings it back into our timeline. So we right click on the thumbnail down here on the timeline and we click on edit in and we say edit in Adobe Photoshop 2020 and it automatically comes across. You can see Adobe Photoshop is opening up and it will open our photo here. Now before I go any further we'll actually quickly skip back into Lightroom because I'd like to show you something. So we go Alt Tab. Okay we're in Lightroom. Now if we come up here to the edit panel 
and we go up here to preferences. We go general and we have presets and then we have external editing. This is where you set your parameters for the exporting of an image from Lightroom to Photoshop. So you can see here our file format is TIFF. Now we could select a TIFF file or a PSD file but I prefer to work in TIFF and the color space here we have Profoto, Adobe RGB, Display, P3 or sRGB. I prefer to use sRGB in all my photos. This is basically what all printers use and all that. It's what the internet is built on. Mobile phone photos are built on that. So keep everything nice and standard and everything is in Adobe sRGB. And the resolution is at 240. All my photos, this is how they're done. So I keep everything right and I have compression set to none. I don't worry about the bottom here. The bottom part here is actually my presets for all the NIC profiles. But I just want to show you here how I export photos to Photoshop. So I click OK. So we'll go back across to Photoshop. Now in Photoshop, in Content Aware, there's two tools you can use. You can use the first, the easiest one is we just do lasso here. See down the bottom here, this little stick that's just sticking out. All we do is just, we scroll around it. And once it's highlighted, you can see there's, it's dotted around. We right click on the mouse and we click on fill. Now we have to make sure in the contents here that we have content aware. And then the blending mode, you've only got two modes that you can use. It's either normal or dissolve. Most of the time, I find normal is good. If normal doesn't work, just click over to dissolve. So we click normal and we click, and the opacity here always stays at 100% and we click OK. And there you go. If we zoom in here, you can't see where we've taken it out. Now, we'll do the same thing for this little stick here. So we come around, give ourselves a little bit of a cushion around here. We click on it and we click fill, click OK. Now, can you see that it's actually added just a little bit, another little one there? But we can just come back around, click it again, click fill, click OK. That's it, it's gone. Now we can do the same here for a bit of this leaf that is still in this image. I'll show that I can use Dissolve if I wanted to. We click on Dissolve, click OK. Now this computer sometimes is a little bit slow because I'm actually screen recording at the same time as part of the video. That's it, but it didn't do, it didn't do a very good job. But, so we'll go back. It's the same thing as a Lightroom, Control Z. Now, what we'll do is we'll highlight it again. We'll highlight it again. Now, instead this time of using, of right clicking, we come up here to the edit panel and we scroll down here to where it says content aware fill. And we click on it. Now, can you see in content aware fill how things work very differently? You have a preview panel, but can you see all this green here? What this green is telling you is this is the area that it's actually choosing to fill that hole. So I just want sand in there. I just want that color. So what I do is I'll just paint out where the branch is because I don't want that. And you'll see it'll just update itself. Now you can actually see it doesn't really look good like that. So we control control Z bring it back. Okay, that looks much better. So we'll just leave it like that and we click OK. That's it. And we'll do the same thing to this side here. But if we look here on our layers here, can you see that it shows a background copy? Because 
this tool actually adds like a layer so the easiest way is just to come up here to layers and you go flatten image or a shortcut key for merging down is control E and we get rid of that little layer because if you're not careful and then you build these little layers up that layer is only in the corner here so if you're trying to get rid of this stick in that layer it's not going to do anything because there's nothing there to start with so here we'll actually just paint around the stick now you don't have to be very close there and we'll try the fill first we click OK now that's actually worked quite well for the fill but what I would normally do is I would actually go up here to edit content aware fill and it's working that's it see it's taking it out sometimes I've found though you can see that it's actually into the bird and all that sometimes I've found that you've got to be, be very pedantic and take away all the other colors for the fill to work properly so we click OK now we can see we've got this layer here so we press we do a control E and we've gotten rid of the layer if you really want to be pedantic and get rid of all this little rubbish on the beach right in the front here all we could do is go along very carefully and select it all now we come up here edit content aware fill that's it and click OK looks much more natural because there's nothing down the bottom to distract so I wouldn't go any further it's a beach shot it still looks fairly natural so we're happy with this so now all we do is we click up here on the file and we click close and it'll say save changes we say yes now if we come back to Lightroom there it is it's on the bottom side here it's actually done it and if we click reference and active we'll grab this photo here there so on the right here is the photo that we started in Adobe Lightroom and on the left is what we've brought out of Photoshop and you can see there's a very big difference so we can cycle between the two and you can see this one here is much more appealing we've just gotten rid of all the distraction and this little piece here isn't that distracting at all so from here all we do is export our photos so that's it we've edited three photos it's taken us about 50 minutes on the whole video but realistically you'd probably do this in less than half the time I don't have a huge amount of time even though I work from home I love taking photos but I try to minimize the amount of time that I spend on the computer so I use shortcut keys and this is why I use the the profile and I've got quite a few settings already set up and once you start understanding your workflow the more you do the same workflow the quicker you actually get and you'll find that normally a photo will only take me about five or six minutes so these three photos we've taken me only about 15 maybe 18 minutes to do and then that's it I can just go and do something else so thanks for watching this video if you like the video give me a thumbs up subscribe to my youtube channel down here and keep an eye out for some upcoming videos or look at some of the past tutorials that I've already done here on youtube so until next time it's Charles for Charles and Photography